September was gone in Alton. One morning it was just October. The bluffs were streaked with red and gold as if fall had come overnight. It was still warm in the afternoon, but the evening began to whisper about sweaters. It was Indian summer when you saw the purple and red-grained ears of corn in baskets at the grocery store, and the dead leaves began to scratch along the sidewalks. In the chill of the evening, the man walked his dog along the silent street, just a half block from the Mississippi River. The dog and his man came down the hill traveling along a broken sidewalk next to a parking lot that was illuminated by lighted haze from sodium lights. The dog snuffled along, catching a hint of some forgotten animal on the pavement or a dropped piece of food that had not been washed away by the rain. But then the dog stopped, his attention on another man walking nearby. It was not his owner. This other man, the dog believed, was a threat. The man that belonged to the dog turned to look, and he saw the other man, who was wearing dirty clothing that had rips and tears. His hair was long and tangled, his beard matted and unkempt. On this cool night, the other man wore no shoes. The dog began to growl, and then he began to bark. The other man did not belong there. The dog wanted to chase him away. He strained at his leash while the man held him back. Then the dog felt the calm of his man as he took hold of the dog's collar. He whispered soothing words but the dog's terror did not subside. The man looked up, unsure of whether to apologize to the other man, the barefoot man in the tattered clothing, or chase him away. But when he looked up, the other man was gone. He'd not fled or walked away, he'd simply vanished. The ragged man had disappeared. Shaken, the man and the dog returned home. Later that night, the dog would whimper in his sleep, dreaming of whatever frightens a dog. The man's sleep would not easily come. When he told his wife what had happened at the parking lot near the river, her eyes had grown wide. She had heard the stories that her husband had not. The parking lot from which the ragged man had vanished had once been the site of the most notorious prison in Illinois, and the place where some of Alton's first ghost stories were told. Welcome to the latest episode of American Hauntings, the podcast dedicated to the history, hauntings, legends, and lore of America's past. Hosted by Cody Beck and Troy Taylor, our first season explores the hauntings of Alton, Illinois, one of the most haunted small towns in America. This is the first of a special two-part episode about the infamous Alton Penitentiary, the first prison in Illinois and one of the most brutal Confederate prisons during the Civil War. Construction on Illinois' very first penitentiary was completed in 1833. Located in Alton, then the population center of the state, there was not another building like it in Illinois. In fact, there were few structures like it in the world. Penitentiaries were an American invention. Before 1829, lawbreakers were abruptly punished after being found guilty of a crime. They might be whipped or beaten or hanged, but they were not imprisoned. The Quakers in Pennsylvania began to consider the idea that if a man had some time to sit and think about the crimes he'd committed, he might become penitent for them, and when released, live a life free of crime. So they built the first penitentiary, Eastern State, in 1829 and changed the history of American crime and punishment forever. By the 1820s, Illinois was a pretty wild and lawless place. It had been the Wild West for decades, about as far as a man could go when looking for freedom. There weren't a lot of towns, few laws, and almost no police officers. A man who wanted to commit crimes could just about do what he pleased. As civilization began to come to Illinois, though, things changed, and with civilization came the idea of a state penitentiary. It was designed in 1830 and completed three years later as 24 stone cells that were supposed to hold all of the lawbreakers in the state. Available space didn't last long, and for the next two decades, new construction at the prison was ongoing. By the time the place closed down, there were 256 stone cells, several outbuildings, shops, and a hospital. 
The prisoners worked at hard labor during the day, mostly in local quarries, and were locked up in their cells at night. Punishment for breaking the rules was brutal. The food was poor, the clothing was worse. There was no heat, a shortage of food, and a lack of running water and medical care. The prison was plagued by rats and vermin and mismanaged by greedy wardens who were paid by the state. Many of the men who were incarcerated at Alton died soon after the release. Their health and their spirits were broken by the harsh conditions. Conditions at the penitentiary were so bad that by the 1850s, it had gotten the attention of a social reformer named Dorothea Dix, who was touring the Western states looking at the operation of prisons and asylums. She successfully petitioned the Illinois legislature for changes, but it took seven years before anything was done about how horrible the Alton Penitentiary had become. Rather than clean the place up though, they just closed it down. By then, the largest population of the state was no longer in Alton, it was in Chicago, so plans were made for a new prison in Joliet, Illinois. The first prisoners were moved from Alton in 1859 and were put to work building their own penitentiary in Joliet. The Alton prison was closed down, but it would not stay closed for long. Soon, even greater hardship would be experienced by the men who were incarcerated there, and hundreds, even thousands, would die behind the locked gates of the prison's stone walls. But even before that time, the seeds of the prison's ghostly legends had already been planted. The tales did not begin at the prison, but at another place nearby, a wooded trail known as Hop Hollow Road. The horrifying conditions at the prison led to many deaths during its early years in operation. Disease, abuse, malnutrition, and cold claimed the lives of scores of prisoners. The prison itself was located on the edge of the community, steps away from the riverfront, and among the warehouses and businesses located at the edge of downtown. There was no room to bury the dead. So when men died, their bodies were taken to a small goat pasture on the north side of town to be buried. When a man died at the prison hospital, his body was floated onto a raft and up the river to Smeltzer's Landing, where he was loaded on a wagon and hauled up Hop Hollow Road to the graveyard. When the corpse arrived, he was buried in a shallow, unmarked grave and forgotten. Or at least that's how it was supposed to work. Legend had it that some of the bodies never arrived at the graveyard. Rumors claimed that some of the guards would load the bodies onto wagons at the ferry landing, as they were supposed to do, but never traveled all the way up Hop Hollow Road. Rather than exert that much effort, they simply drug the bodies into the woods and left them there. A bottle might be pulled out or a card game might be played, and then, when enough time had passed, they would return to the prison as if the burial had taken place just as it was supposed to. Was this rumor true? Well, no one could say for sure, but it just might explain the eerie stories that have been told about Hop Hollow Road. The stories say that the men who were never buried do not rest in peace. Over the years, their ghosts have been seen along the roadway, and some believe these phantoms are searching for a ride to the cemetery where their bodies were supposed to have been taken. The unlikely drivers who pick up these hitchhikers were always shocked when the passenger simply vanished without a trace from the seat next to them. At that point, the story goes, they realized they picked up a ghost. The best advice that we can offer is this. If you happen to be driving along Hop Hollow Road some night and see someone standing on the edge of the road, waving his arms and looking for a ride, well, you may not want to pick him up. In our next episode, we'll continue our history of the Alton Penitentiary at the start of the Civil War and how a smallpox epidemic created a number of ghost stories that are still told today. Question mark. Oh, what I already kind of threw that. Okay. In, so we're good. Okay. So. Cool. Um, how are we at about a half hour for this one? Do you think since it's like an hour yeah, running? Okay, I'll get into that more the next time. Awesome. Um, at the end, I mention it, and then uh, we can talk about it. Okay, we're still recording that, right? Sweet. Okay. Welcome to American Hauntings Podcast, where we discuss history, hauntings, legends, lore, and all things paranormal. You are listening to Episode 5 of Season 1, covering the hauntings of Alton, Illinois. I'm your co-host, Cody Beck, and with me once again, my co-host is author, historian, crime buff, and founder of American Hauntings, Troy Taylor. What's going on, Troy? Oh wow, it's uh, it's been a long week, but a good one. But a good one. Yeah, it's, uh, things are uh, finally coming into spring as we record this. Weather's nice finally, so uh, I think uh, things are coming together nice, and it's starting to be ghost season again. 
See, people think that's only in October, but right. really it should be in the winter time. But no one wants to do anything in the winter time. No, I'm, I'm happy. It's, it's the most wonderful time of the year. It is. I'm, it is. I'm excited. I think the main point of this episode for me is just good life advice is just don't pick up hitchhikers. I know. Ever. Isn't it? Yeah, I think it is too. For I think reason. stories like that got started when it was okay to pick up hitchhikers. Right. You know, every, every phantom hitchhiker story, now you, you hear those stories and you go, why would I pick anyone up? Right. You know, a girl in a white dress in front of a cemetery. Why would I pick that person up? No right. one would now. But in, you know, 1934, that seemed like a great plan. It's like, yeah, know, she so. seems legit. Let yeah, exactly. You know, just don't mind the blood all over her dress or whatever, you know. <laughs> and so. I, I love the the story of it's just like stereotypical like uh, government workers it's just like they take the body up there you think they're going to do their job but <laughs> yeah. no they're just yeah. you know getting drunk on our dime well you know the, the the thing behind that the the funny thing about that story is that you know um a lot of the a lot of that was like a, a something that started when the prison was open and, and continued on later when it was just you know a confederate penitentiary yeah. um it was said that the soldiers did the same thing and you know i had heard that story for a long time and um i was living down here when there was a story that popped up in the newspaper that some kids had found a body in the woods up along that road yeah and the police had gone out there you know it, it called the police it was obviously human remains and it called the police and when they went out and they they kind of dug up the body and found you know some clothing still like some leather pieces and that kind of stuff and dated it they believed to the civil war or before and then suddenly wow. you're like huh <laughs> you know maybe yeah. that wasn't just a story you know right. uh, maybe there there really is some truth to that uh, about them dumping the bodies i mean stories like that you know we talked about this before but i mean stories get like that get started for a reason right you know they they have a seed of truth for sure and uh, i would say that somebody you know, probably was sitting around in a bar one night and went, ah, we don't bother taking those bodies all the way. We just dump them out in the woods. Who cares? You know, and, th and then somebody spread the story and it went a little further. And then, you know, before long, you've got this legend. And then soon you've got a ghost story because, I mean, again, that's one of those things where it only takes one. Yeah. It only takes one person to have been up around a you know, a roadway and saw a phantom on the side of the road kind of thing and, and tells the story to somebody else. Because, I mean, that's, I mean, I actually have a personal experience with this. Not that I saw, mm -hmm. but was there when it happened. Uh, when I first moved here to Alton, before we started doing our walking tours, um, we did trolley tours. My friend, Sonny Irvin, uh, had a trolley company at the time and he, yeah. he talked me into doing tours with him. So we were out on a tour one night and we, you know, we did all the usual places, all of which we'll talk about in the podcast. And we're on our way up and we were driving down, not the old stretch of Hopella Road that went to the Blue Pool. That's all, that's all gone. There's no road there. Right. But where it connected to, there's still a piece of Hopella Road that goes up to what's now the Confederate Cemetery, but was a goat pasture back then. And we were driving along that road, and I, I always usually, t when I tell this story, I start it with, it was a dark and stormy night. And it really was, okay? <laughs> so it's raining, and it's cold, and uh, you know the inside, the windows are fogged up in the trolley. And, and we had a routine, a, like a set routine that we would do as we went down this road. I mean, because, you know, ghost tours are entertainment. And sure. so we were... You know, this was our, our way of entertaining the group. And as we would travel along this road and it's pitch dark and every once in a while a branch had brushed the top of the trolley and, and there's a, a great mood, right? right. So I would tell the story and I would get a little quieter and a little quieter as we went, you know, so everybody had to really pay attention to what I was saying. Right. So I'm just getting to the part of the story where they're bringing bodies up by wagon up Hop Hollow Road. Well, all of the sudden, now this is before I got to the point about dumping bodies and ghostly hitchhikers. I hadn't gotten that far yet. Two women in the back part of the trolley, and I still, to in my mind, can see where they were sitting in my head. Mm -hmm. To my right, second seat from the back. And they started screaming, screaming. I mean, and it just, because everything was so quiet, I mean, it just terrified everybody on the trolley, yeah. right? I mean, to the point that Sonny actually pulled over off to the side to, 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 to see what was going on. I mean, we didn't, we had no idea. He said, ma'am, please hold all your screams to yeah, the end of the tour. Yeah, until the end of the story, Thank right? Thank you. So anyway, so we stop and these women are like, you know, well, you know, what's going on? And these women were like, well, as we were driving up this road, we had just wiped off the, you know, the, the film on the window and looked out and they had both seen a man standing on the side of the road, waving his arm at the trolley and 
disappeared. Oh, man. And that's when they started screaming. Now, at this point, I had not Discuss published that. the book. Right. I had never told the story. They were not from Alton, so they couldn't even have heard it locally. They came from, like, Kansas City somewhere and, and came to take the tour. So didn't know anything about the, any of the history. Didn't know there was a supposed to be phantom hitchhikers along that road. Nothing. Right. And yet here was this thing that had happened exactly like all the stories said to two people who'd never heard the stories. Yeah. And um, ever since then, I've always thought, you know, it was kind of like, you know, in our, in, an, in, in our past episode, I, I talked about the ghostly little girl at the Ruble Hotel, but yeah. I never really believed it. Mm-hmm. Well, then suddenly uh, something tells me maybe there's something to this. You, you it's exactly Abigail what crying. happened on Hop Hollow Road. Yeah. It's made me think that, hey, maybe there is something to this story. So, um, you know, all of these, everything we talk about in every single episode of the podcast, I think... You know, no matter how far-fetched a lot of it might seem, Mm -hmm. I think there is a seed of truth to, well, just about any story that you hear. Right, and it's good that it kind of legitimizes it a little bit. I think it does, too. I think it does, too. These stories have been around for a long time. Um, The prison is, and and we'll talk about that in in the next episode, Mm -hmm. but the prison was really the first publicized, like, in the newspapers, ghost stories that you heard about Alton was what was left of the prison and the people who had experiences there. So there's a, a lot of history. I mean, Alton, Alton's ghosts are all about history. I mean, everything that, that is a ghost story here in town that's a legitimate ghost story has something behind it that is historically based, which right. is what makes it interesting for me. You for know, sure. And I think, it, like you said, it does make it seem a lot more legitimate than it might have otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because I, you know, I've read I read that story in your book and I thought it was it was very intriguing, and I. But honestly, I never knew about the prison or, or any of that sort of stuff until one night we, we were just we were at uh, Big Muddy Pub, and I went out back, and I was just kind of stumbling around, hammered, and found <laughs> this little, this little you know wall. Yeah, the and, little the monument. Yeah, there, and I started, which is not even where the prison was actually it, right. located, which makes it even better. Well, yeah. right. So that's why anytime <laughs> anytime I've heard since then, people are saying like, "Yeah, we've been at that you know monument, and strange stuff starts going on." I'm like, "That's." That's not even where it's the yard, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, but maybe there's something with the well, stones. There, Who knows? Right. Exactly. I don't know. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I think it's when I, you know, little kids creep me out. But when I really, really <laughs> sit back and think about it, I think being in prison, especially back then, but even now, is probably the most terrifying oh, thing I, I can I would think, think of. So too. But when you describe the conditions of the prison and, and the things that those people had to go through, it sounds like it's just, that's hell. That's well, a, a it's, nightmare. you know, and the the penitentiaries, well, like asylums and everything else in our past we're all started with good intentions that's yep. that's the thing i mean you know and they're, well, the they're actually right have been done i know when intentions. you know you know hell hell is paved with a road you know the right. road to hell is paved with good intentions and i think that that's a perfect example i mean you know the asylums in the in the late 1800s and early 1900s that just deteriorated into a living hell and so did the prisons i mean they started out with the idea of you know here's something humane we should do for these people they've committed a crime but you know what they may not be bad guys yeah you know they're 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 killers with a heart of gold so let's right. give them a chance to sit around and think about it for a right. while you know and maybe by the time it's done and you know and when they started that first penitentiary in philadelphia and and i've been there several times and it's a it's a very cool place you know also with a great haunted reputation but um you know, they these guys were in solitary confinement. They had these these tiny cells, mm-hmm. which had running water in them in 1829. I mean, the White oh, wow. House didn't have running water in 1829. Right. But it was so these people would never have contact with another person. That's the but worst. When they got there, a hood was put over their head. They were marched to the cell. They were locked up, and they didn't leave it except to go out in, outside to get some fresh air into a wall courtyard mm-hmm. behind their cell with walls that were like 10 feet tall. They never saw another person. Man, and man. it We're drove a lot creatures. of them insane. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it drove literally drove a lot of them insane. Yeah, And so eventually that ended too because, well, that seemed like a great idea, but that's not so great. So let's do something else. Um, the, the penitentiary here in Alton was never meant to be solitary confinement. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more like the prison that was built in Auburn, New York at the same time. And it was the Auburn system is what they called it. And that's what the Alton Penitentiary was. And it was a similar in that the prisoners were brought in. They worked all day at hard labor. Yeah. Um, they weren't allowed to talk. 
it was supposed to be complete silence. I mean, that's impossible to, yeah, you know, of course. As, as any teacher can tell I was you, say, that's get impossible a, get to, a room full of kids to, yeah, tell them to, not to, talk. to keep from not talking. But, uh, but they worked all day at hard labor and then they were stuck in their cell at night. And uh, it was limited social, you know, gatherings there, but at least you saw other people, yeah. you know, you, at least you could probably talk to someone. But when the conditions were as terrible as they were, I mean, is it any wonder that that area is haunted? Of course. I mean, you, you talk know. about the, the strong emotions and impressions that yeah. could be left on something. That's probably the, the worst you know, yeah, conditions absolutely. you can think of. So it makes sense that there's some sort of, you know, memories of that trap there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, I, and we'll talk about that more in our next episode. For sure. And I never thought about it until, you know, uh, reading a little bit about what you said and how before they had prison systems, it was a little bit different. It's just, if you gave me the option now, it's like I commit a crime. It's like, we're going to lock you up or we're going to, you know, give you 50 lashes. I'd be like, time me up take the lashes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, after you read that stuff, you, it makes you think even back then, I'm sure a lot of guys wish they could have just gotten yeah. the beating, you right. know, and, One and done. moved on. But, you know, back then and, and prison sentences, even, you know, in the 1830s, you know, for murder, you might get two years. You know, it wasn't like now where, you know, you right. end up there for life. You might get a couple of years. But the problem was that it might as well be a death sentence because mm. you either died in prison or you were so sick by the time you left that you dropped dead a few months later. Somebody actually did a study in like the 1850s mm. of, you know, guys who had served time at the Alton Penitentiary and how long they actually lived when they got out. Yeah. And it was sometimes it would be less than a year. I think that was sort of the average. Because they were right. just so sick and so, you know, crippled up by the time they left. There was just, you know, no, you just couldn't go on. Right. So that's miserable. Yeah. So. All right. Well, with that, let's uh, I should we wrap things up. So thank you, everybody, for listening um, again. As we tell you every episode, please share this with your friends. Please tell your friends about it. If you like it, if you hate it and you think it's terrible, tell them, hey, listen to this podcast. This is so bad. It's so, so bad. You as long as you're it. listening. So, yeah. I anyway, if you uh, are enjoying it, give us a review on iTunes. Um, it helps us kind of. So it makes it easier for people to find us. If we can get some reviews in there, um, that's always uh, always a good thing. So uh, or get in touch with us if there's something uh, I think as Cody has mentioned in the past, if, if there's something you want to hear on a future episode, uh, we are doing our first season about Alton, but I think we'll probably be moving on to other things for upcoming seasons. So if there's something in particular that you want to hear about, uh, please let us know and we will be happy to include it in a future episode. For sure. And, you know, after doing some of these now that I think about you know in the we, we definitely have enough material just in Alton to do another season yeah, if we wanted to so. you know yeah. so we definitely might consider coming back here so yeah let us know if there's something you want to hear well when you're hearing this episode which is part one of the Alton Penitentiary episode uh, this will also be the week before the tours go on sale for Alton Hauntings for the fall uh, we'll have tours running through September into October and the first weekend in November uh, this year we're going to include not only our, uh, and I'm going to say this, award-winning uh, Haunted History walking tours. Uh, we will also have our, a, uh, our bus tours that will be running at 8 o'clock on weekend evenings, as well as a handful of our extended Ghost Hunters tours. Uh, those are hosted by my friend Luke Daliborski, who is the author of a number of books uh, about ghosts and hauntings in southern Illinois, including in Alton. And Luke does an extended tour that has an extra hour of hauntings with additional locations and a different parts of the locations that we normally go into. So those are always a lot of fun too. So those will be coming up. Tickets go on sale August 14th, uh, which will be a week from when you are hearing this podcast. Uh, so check into the Alton Hauntings website at altonhauntings.com. Check the calendar. You can get your tickets starting uh, early in the morning on August 14th and take part in all of the history and hauntings tours that are coming up uh, in the 2017 Halloween season. We aim to combine historic record, scientific method, observation, and imagination in order to teach you a little bit more about the paranormal activities of Alton, Illinois. American Hauntings is a bi-weekly podcast. You can hear new episodes every other Monday, so please tune in to hear our latest episode and receive a brand new paranormal history lesson. 
You can learn more about our podcast and find new episodes on iTunes by searching for American Hauntings or by going to AmericanHauntingsPodcast.com, where we also have links to some of Troy's books as well as other information about upcoming ghost tours and things like that. As for your host, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at CodyBeckSTL or CodyBeck.com. Please say hello or tell me how much you hate or love the show. You can find Troy on Twitter at TroyTaylor13 and on Facebook by searching for the Troy Taylor author page or by going to Facebook.com slash author TT. You can also check him out at AmericanHauntings.net. And this episode was produced and recorded at Lighthouse Sound Studios. For more information, find them at LighthouseSounds.com.